modular quantum computing uh, architecture. So basically taking several of these uh, nodes where we have you know, uh, 5, 10 qubits per node or so and, and the ancilla, and then use the optics to, to couple the different nodes uh, in, a modular, in a modular way. And those of you who are familiar with the work by, for example, Chris Monroe or David Lucas, uh, this is very similar to what is done in, in, in ion traps, where they would just have you know, a couple of ions. And then the, the same thing, there's an optical connection. Of course, the beauty of the optical connections is that you can really connect anything to anything. So you're not limited anymore to like nearest neighbor interactions, but in principle, you can hook, you know, the, the uh, connections can be really non-local within your quantum computer. Now, this is work that's pursued by uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Tim Taminio, it's here on the slide. Um, the work that uh, I'm doing myself now is, is to go to really long-range quantum networks. So we want to combine uh, now a few qubit nodes, electron spin, and make these, these you know, uh, optical links really long-range. We want to use that for fundamental tests. Also, we have this sort of this dream of a, a uh, quantum internet. And so. Uh, to give you an idea of the plan, so that the five-year plans is to make uh, a four-node network uh, in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands sounds like oh, all over the country, but Netherlands is a small country, so it's not, it's not like in Canada. If you do it in Canada, it would be really big. But you know, to give you an idea, it's sort of the 50, 100 kilometer uh, distance, and then four different uh, nodes in, 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 in different cities. Um, and of course, you can use this for uh, a lot of things, for example, device-independent crypto. Okay, so where are we with these nodes? Um, so you know what we can do with the belt tests and uh, remote entanglement. In terms of these nodes, we've learned in the past years to, to control up to five of these nuclear spins now, and then together with the MV center that makes us a five qubit register. And we found out that these nuclear spins are very long coherence times. So by doing the same uh, dynamical decoupling tricks, uh, it's a bit hard to see on this. So this is uh, seconds now on the, on, the, on the axis, and you see, for example, this red curve goes well beyond uh, one second. And it means that uh, we will not be limited by intrinsic decoherence in the system. We will be limited by the errors that we are making. And that's, in the sense, of a very good starting point for these type of technologies. And one uh, very cool experiment that uh, uh, Tim has done last year is to take three of these nuclear spins, uh, encode logical qubit in it, and then run repeated error correction on it. So what he did is uh, do uh, parity measurements, uh, process these parity measurements, do a real-time correction of the, of the error, and then repeat the whole cycle without leaving the encoded space. So the qubit stays encoded, and you can really run repeated error correction on them. And using that, he showed that uh, he could improve the, the defacing time of the physical qubits. So here's, I don't know if you can see it, so these are, this is uh, average uh, state fidelity. Um, and what you see here, this is the decay curve of a function of time for the best physical qubit in the system. So the nuclear spin with the longest defacing time. And this is, the purple is the line which you get if you apply quantum error correction on the three nuclear spins. So if you code the quantum information in three nuclear spins, apply error correction, and you see actually this is, uh, this is uh, quite a big improvement over the best qubit that is uh, in that system. So I think it's a very important step. So that let me summarize and uh, uh, look forward again. So I've shown you that we can use these spins in diamond to do, uh, to create remote entanglement, to do a teleportation experiments and a loop of free belt test. And uh, then we want to combine this now with control over single nuclear spins to create multi-qubit registers. And now we want to hook them up and we create really quantum networks. And I think the, the goals for the, so the next one or two years will be to make to, to demonstrate the first uh, quantum repeater, to do remote entanglement purification. I think we're not so far from these two results. And then in the end, you really scale this up to a multi-node network. At that time, we have to see, you know, is this in a year, five years or so from now, we have to see is this feasible, you know, to really scale it up even larger? Is it, uh, you know, then other things come into play? Can you make it cheap? Can you make it efficient? Can you make it fast? And so on. But in the end, our dream is uh, sort of a global quantum network. So with that, uh, I want to thank the people on this slide. This is a picture that we took uh, during a party when our uh, bell paper came out. So this is, you see this uh, uh, picture again on the, on the slide. So just to uh, point out a few people. Stephanie, most of you know. This is uh, David, Stephanie's postdoc. Uh, let's see, where is, uh, right here is uh, Tim. Um, and this is uh, uh, Morgan Mitchell. So he actually flew over for uh, five hours just to 
joined the party. He lives in Barcelona. He took a plane, came to join the party, and then he flew back. Okay. <laughs> but it was a good party. Uh, you see, we're, we're all very happy here. And this is uh, Bas Hansen, who is uh, the first author and really the main, main driver of this, uh, of this experiment. So I also want to thank the funding agencies and then finally you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the question is, uh, does sending the photons through the beam splitter suffice to create the entanglement? Um, uh, no, uh, because we need the uh, nonlinearity of the measurement process. So the measurement process selects out one of the branches, uh, and all the branches together don't give us an entangled state. But it's the, if we measure them, if we project uh, onto one of the branches, then uh, we get an entangled state. I don't know if you're more familiar with teleportation, but you can see the same thing also as teleportation. Um, so maybe I'll just get that slide up. Um, yeah. So you can also see the whole process as, so, so there's entanglement between, oh, let me go one back. Oh. So there's entanglement here, there's entanglement here. You could also see it as uh, teleporting the state of this photon onto this spin. Uh, and if you do that, then these two would be entangled, right? Because this one was initially entangled with this one. And so uh, what we do here, here is actually a bell state measurement on these two guys. So there's a bell state measurement here. And if we select uh, out the outcome for which there's no correction needed on Bob's uh, qubit, which, which we actually do, uh, then the uh, teleportation ends up with uh, you know, this state ending up here. So that's another way of looking at it. But you really need the nonlinearity of that measurement. Uh, to have it happen. It's not, it's not enough to send it through the beams with them. Yep. Uh, so you have this uh, quantum network nodes. You have like a five qubit register. So is it like you really just have five qubits for each node or in principle you can have a much larger node? That's a very good question. Um, so up now we, uh, I, uh, I, can, uh, I can prove to you that we can control five. Um, I don't think we can control 100 locally. Uh, there are reasons, technical reasons why that will be uh, difficult. Uh, but somewhere between five and 100, there will be a limit. Uh, so it could be 10. And maybe it also depends on the, in, in, in this case, we look at nuclear spins that just happen to be at some location, and maybe it actually hap uh, matters where they are exactly, that some configurations are more uh, useful than others. But uh, so, so definitely five. Uh, I think we can do 10 uh, with pretty good fidelities, and maybe after that it will be uh, But this is sort of the idea. Uh, and because there is a limit, we actually need to go into a network also for computation. So yeah, by making these uh, small modules and hooking them up with uh, photonics, we can actually expand. And that's a way to, to, to scale in the system. Yeah. A, okay. What happened to Bob? Do you know what happened to Bob? And how do you prevent it from what, what happened to the old Bob? Yeah. You mean? <laughs> no. Um, so so uh, when this happened to us, we also asked other people working on MV centers whether they see this, that uh, centers disappear. And so it, it does seem to happen sometimes. Uh, we had done measurements on Bob for, uh, I think, more than two and a half years. Uh, so it was stable for two and a half years. And, um, so I had uh, one uh, suspicion, and that is that uh, Bob had lost uh, two electrons. So if it loses one electron, it goes to a different charge state. We can actually pump it back, we know. But if it's two electrons, it may have energy levels that we don't know. Uh, and then maybe we try to you know, somehow pump it back, but we couldn't. Uh, but it's very speculative, so nobody, nobody really uh, understands what can happen. So that's the, the other option would be that really the, the, the center disintegrated, that like this nitrogen atom moved. But the energy barriers are so extremely high, and it also happened at a time when there was nothing, we didn't do anything to the center. So it, was, it wasn't room temperature, it was not that, it's not because we shoot, shoot lasers at it or so. There's one last suspicion, and that's that uh, this nuclear test reactor has something to do with it. <laughs> So it may, maybe it produces 
some particles that kick out the uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. But, but yeah, the answer is that we, we actually don't know. How about sabotage? Could be, but it's, it, actually this, this uh, center is uh, very well guarded. Uh, it's very hard to get in. So there must have been somebody with access, and there were only, I think, five people with access to that room. So yeah, who knows? <laughs> Last question. <coughs> Only one question. I think it's very nice work. Uh, just one question. So, so maybe I don't do not understand that well because you use some kind of event ready uh, entanglement. I just wonder how can you deal with the problem with because anyway you 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 do with some detection and to see oh. We have our uh, we have entanglement. How can you deal with the time correlation between the final bear test and uh, with uh, your event ready detectors? Some kind of. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I understand your question. Um, so, but the answer should be in the uh, space-time diagram. Uh, so the the event ready signal. Uh, we can have an event-ready signal, right? That's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the event-ready signal can constitute a loophole if uh, at, at the time that, that that signal is generated, there's some information available on the bell test. So for example, it knows the random uh, uh, input bits. And we make sure that that's not the case. So at, that, at that station, so at the time that that uh, decision is made, whether it's a valid trial or not, there's no information on the bell trial available at all. There's nothing. So it's, yeah. There, there's, there's actually nothing that can go wrong there. I don't know if this answers your question, so maybe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so pe people have tried to do these tests for a while, right? Um, was there any fundamental insight that allowed you to do it, or is it just a progressive improvement in technology that allowed you to finally get a loophole free test? Yeah, I think the, so, so the, the goal has been there uh, for a while. Um, uh, and mostly uh, there were, I think, technical limitations that prevented people from doing it. So for example, in the photonic experiments, the detectors were just not efficient enough. And there's a threshold efficiency below which you just cannot do the uh, belt test. And these detectors have only been uh, become available over the uh, last few years. Uh, in our case, it's, um, um, uh, so we, we did this remote entanglement only three years ago, which is sort of the you know, basic ingredient for this. So yeah, in our case, it's just a matter of we were developing, 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 uh, and we just needed the uh, right skills to do it. Um, and I, I think that's true for all the other tests as well. It's just a matter of overcoming difficulties or you know, there's some new technology available. So the, the, in the photon case, it's definitely the detectors. Um, for example, uh, ion traps, uh, some people with ion traps wanted to do this, uh, and they were hindered by the fact that the photons that they use in these type of schemes, they are uh, too blue. So they're, they're too high energy, and then the losses are too high. And then if they would try one kilometer, that would be like the rate would be one per year. So, so that's also uh, one of the possible obstacles. So I, I think it's really technical. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we will have to move on now. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, just while the uh, the next speaker is, is setting up. I'll mention that, um, as you, you probably know, that on the, um, the, on the web page for the conference, there's a, a scientific program with a table that shows the layout of the week. And below that is, is a list of titles and author names. And uh, if you go to that list now then you, uh, and you tap on the, the title, then, uh, then it expands and you get an abstract and, uh, and then plus some links to archive papers. And if you're finished reading the abstract, you can tap again, and then it shrinks back. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Gibran Rashid for, for doing a lot of work in setting up this, uh, this website.
Okay, so the next, um, the next talk is based on work of uh, Mike Mazurek, uh, Matthew Pusey, um, Ravi Kunjwal, Kevin Resch, Rob Speck, and the title is Non-Contextuality Violation as a Robust Quantum Resource, and Matthew is giving the talk. Uh, okay, so I think it's uh, kind of appropriate that uh, I got put after the last talk because uh, I think certainly as far as quantum information is concerned, um, the cauchy specker theorem, which is about contextuality, uh, is kind of a poor brother of Bell's theorem. Um, for example, I don't think anyone really knows uh, exactly what a loophole-free contextuality experiment uh, would mean if that even makes sense, um, much less like what the information processing applications of such a thing would be. Um, and I think that should sort of really worry anybody who's interested in contextuality. Um, it certainly worries me, and so it's been something I've been working on. Um, so, I mean, given these kind of worries, you might wonder, like, why be interested in contextuality at all? Um, I, I kind of have a, a foundational perspective that, um, you know, I don't think anyone in this room thinks that the only reason or the only non-classical thing about nature is the correlations you get from local measurements on entangled states. Um, and yet somehow that's the only thing that we kind of have a completely rigorous uh, experimental demonstration of um, that doesn't make any reference to the quantum formalism. Um, so for me, it's just a kind of way of broadening that kind of understanding. Um, but there is a practical side to that, um, which is uh, here's like a bunch of papers um, linking contextuality uh, to various information processing uh, tasks. And um, in most of these cases, there just isn't the kind of setup you need. There isn't these local measurements on entangled states that would allow you to even talk about Bell inequalities in these scenarios. So the fact that contextuality is a kind of broader concept means you've got many more opportunities to make these kind of connections. Um, and there's also a sort of very practical reason, which is that um, although the theory of contextuality seems to be a bit trickier, um, the, so far it seems like the experimental requirements are actually easier. Um, basically because you, you don't necessarily need entanglement um, to show contextuality in an experiment. Um, and so if you're going to build technology on that, then, then maybe it will be uh, more practical. OK. Um, so the problem uh, I've been focusing on, or I'm going to talk about in this talk, is whether or not um, contextuality is actually robust uh, in the sense that, you know, as a theorist, you might come up with some proof that uh, quantum mechanics is incompatible with non-contextuality. Um, but then if you ask somebody to implement that in an experiment, and, you know, the stuff they see doesn't quite perfectly match up with, with the ideal quantum description, um, is that perturbation enough that your proof no longer holds? Or do you have some kind of way of dealing with that? Um, because if you, if you don't have that kind of robustness, then it's kind of always just going to be a theori theoretical concept. Um, and the, these kind of connection with information processing isn't really going to work unless, unless you have that robustness. Um, and I'll, I'll be a bit more specific in, in a minute about the problem that I've worked on. Um, so let me first of all just uh, introduce the kind of contextuality I'm going to be talking about. Um, the whole thing is framed in this. Uh, thing called the ontological models formalism. Um, and the idea of that is just that, uh, that's not good. Okay. Almost invisible, sorry. <laughs> it is working, it's just like nearly invisible. Um, so, yeah, not bad idea. Um, the idea is that this, is the, this thing on the left is what you see. So this is the probability of getting outcome k, given that you've done some measurement procedure m, 
on some preparation procedure P. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Thanks. Need an experimentalist laser. Um, <laughs> And the idea is just that you notice that the statistics of these outcomes depend on which preparation you've done. Okay? Seems like a fairly trivial fact. Um, and the idea is you want to explain that correlation by saying the preparation and the measurement are connected by some kind of physical system. And we're just going to assume that that, phys that, that physical system has some kind of, is described by some variable lambda. Okay. And that variable lambda screens off the correlation between the preparation and the measurement outcome in this way. Okay. But we never actually see these lambdas. We just integrate over them um, to get the probabilities that we see. Um, and this, this is the kind of same kind of thinking that's behind something like Bell's theorem. Um, okay. But uh, specifically, uh, if you've heard of non-contextuality, then you'll have probably heard of the cauchy specker type. Um, and what that is, is it takes this framework, <coughs> thanks, <laughs> got quite a collection there. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, so this is the probability of getting uh, outcome k given measurement m and, and this variable I'm going to call the ontic state lambda. Um, and according to Cauchy Speck and non-contextuality, uh, this should be equal to something called the value of the projector on outcome k, and that value should either be 0 or 1. Okay? So that's kind of a very mathematical uh, way of describing it. Um, uh, so to be clear about like, what the actual substantive assumption is here, um, first of all, there's a determinism assumption. Okay? So this, this probability is either 0 or 1. So once you, once you have this complete description of the system, you know for sure which uh, measurement result is going to occur. And the other assumption is that uh, this probability is a function only of the projector onto the outcome you're considering. Okay? So if I have some three outcome <laughs> measurement uh, given by this basis, um, and then I consider a different basis that happens to have the same vector in it, then whether or not this outcome occurs is the same as whether or not this outcome occurs. Okay? Even though Physically, you would have to do two different things to measure these things. And so in principle, you could get a different answer uh, from this projection to this projection. Um, OK, so there's kind of two things that uh, are a bit wor worrisome about this definition. Um, first of all, uh, you're only allowed to talk about projective measurements. OK, so you have these values for projectors. Um, but you can never actually do a projective measurement. You're always going to end up doing a PAVM. Um, and the other concern is that it uses the quantum formalism. right? I explain this whole thing by talking about projectors and bases and all these kind of things. Um, and so if we want something comparable to Bell's theorem that makes no reference to the quantum formalism, then we need to change this a bit. Um, so both of these uh, problems were fixed in this paper. Um, and the idea is just to say, OK, well, the cauchy specker notion refers to the same projector being in two different bases. But what's the operational content of the same projector appearing in two different bases? And the answer is that uh, it means that uh, no matter how you prepare the system, the probability of getting that outcome uh, when you consider the first basis is the same as the probability of getting the outcome when you consider the second basis. Okay? So the probability of getting outcome k of measurement m is equal to the probability of getting outcome k of measurement m primed for all possible preparations. Okay? That's the kind of operational signature of having the same projector appear in two different bases. But now you can just apply this to any measurement at all. Um, and that, you know, this, doesn't, this doesn't involve anything to do with quantum theory. Um, and then we're just going to apply the exact same kind of non-contextuality and say that, well, if operationally these two probabilities are the same for all preparations, we're going to demand that that's explained by these two probabilities being the same.